colonialism and Christianity stimulated positive and negative changes in Africa. And we can't deny that. And, and quite frankly, you are what you are today because of so many changes uh, that were made to the African way of life by colonial rule and Christian influence. And within that colonialism, modernity. And that's why we talk about modern Zambia. So positive and negative changes. But as an imposition, colonial rule had unleashed a, a, deadly, a deadly blow, actually, on African culture. And the consequences, we know them. Yeah? In fact, you can argue that modernity and colonialism destroyed, to some extent, our culture. Not completely. Modified our culture. Introduced foreign or exotic, rather bizarre values unknown to us. So, just let me outline some of the, the values that were introduced as a result of colonialism and to some extent Christianity. Number one, we were introduced to the value of individualism because we were under Capitalist, capitalism, oh, the capitalistic mode of production. That's one thing, individualism, which was totally against our communalism, yeah, totally against our Ubuntu. And secondly, point number two, you can argue actually, that uh, that uh, colonialism introduced corruption in 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 our culture, and you know what corruption is, and it's still with us, and it has become the norm, and and you can see. If I may digress a little bit, if you are following the politics at the moment, everyone, even Jim and Jack, every Jim and Jack wants to become a politician. And the, the, the logic or the rationale is that politics is what brings you money. And politics is what makes you rich. You make money from nowhere and within the shortest possible time. You are rich um, uh, and popular among your supporters or something like that. Number three, colonialism also introduced capitalism. Um, with capitalism, oppression. Capit this Capitalism, really, is, a, I think, in Zambia, for instance, we can talk about laissez-faire capitalism. Let me do a little bit on this. Well, when we became independent, we, uh, Kaunda abolished capitalism and went to socialism. And the... His thinking was, and he was quite right, that this capitalism was exploitative. The means of production were in the hands of um, individuals, private sector. And the poor were poor. So if you didn't have a job, if you didn't have the means, 
you were you remained poor. So Kaunda so went to socialism where the state av- made available to each one of us what they needed. So, for instance, I never my, my education was free from grade one to university, free, and I was even given some allowance on top of that. I didn't have to care about and I ate from the dining halls, whatever, <laughs> so free. So that was socialism. Um, now, but then in 1991, we went back to colonial, there's a fair capitalism. And that's why we even gave away our minds and everything to private hands and we are paying a price for that. And that's because partly colonial masters did not prepare us to look after our own resources and make money and look after ourselves. Yeah, sorry. Uh, let me just answer this. Co- sorry, my I'm in a class. Number four, there was uh, colonialism actually and Christianity for, to, to many extent, to very, very large extent, disrupt, disrupted the traditional machinery. The traditional machinery of moral homogeneity and practice. Um, the homogeneity means homo is comes from homogeneous. Uh, in our own tribes, each tribe had its own values and morals and ethos and things like that. And that held us together. We shared these values, shared values and morals. Colonialism kind of disrupted this by imposing foreign values and trying to impose a foreign a foreign culture on us. Um, number five, the method of moral inculcation was damaged or destroyed. How were morals, ethics inculcated in the young? Or how were the young socialized in their own culture? There was damage done to this by introducing modern education and despising traditional education that caused the problems. And once people had become West educated and westernized, they began to look down upon their own traditions and values. Uh, and so they left the young ones, in, especially in towns and uh, whatever, urban areas and peri-urban areas, they left the young ones to be socialized by media, cinema, and novels, books, things like that. At number six, you can say there was a systematic depersonalization of the African by colonialists and missionaries to, to some extent. A systematic depersonalization of us. Depersonalization is where is we lived traditionally as persons, as humans. Yeah, we Ubuntu, Ubuntu. There was that humanness in us, but uh, colonial rule kind of objectified us, objectified humans. Yeah, we were objects of exploitation. All sorts of things. 
um, we lacked dignity. We're not humans at all. Number seven, there was also paganization of African values. Yeah, we were pagans, or we were paganized. Our values were, because our values were traditional African values and not Christian values and not Western values, we were paganized. And peg, you know the word pagan refers to somebody outside Christendom or outside Western Christianity. So we were pagans. Um, we were we were for for the to the missionaries we were headed to hell, for hell we had to be saved to the colonial master we had to be civilized because we were we were superstitious pagan um, and whatever term eight Communalism, that hallmark of an African, and we talked about this, that hallmark of an African by the name of communalism was destroyed. Uh, in short, you could say that the feeling, the, the we feeling, W-E feeling, we feeling that's how africans it's we we talk in terms of we the we feeling was actually disturbed so we became focusing on on the eye and so the extended family system suffered somewhat um, as people became more nuclear individualistic focusing on their own needs uh, paying very little attention to the extended family and all that. I'm sure you, you, you've you heard of stories and maybe some of you have experienced it in your own families where your parents will ask visitors from the village or from another time, town why they did not inform you that you were coming. Yeah? And, um, and it dispatched sometimes immediately after or a few days after and you admonished and told in clear terms when you want to visit tell us a month in time so th these things happen so colonial rulers promoted their economic and religious values and colonial rulers especially looted our resources. Um, when, we were, when we were in university uh, as undergraduates many years ago, we, one book that was popular because we were inclined to Marxism, socialism in Kaunda's time. One popular book we read was a book by Walter Rodney. Walter Rodney. You might find it, especially in um, in this bookshop at East Park. I think it's Grey Matter. Walter Rodney. Water is A W A L T E R. Rodney is R O D N E Y. A Jamaican. And the, the title of the book was How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. A fantastic book. Uh, so there was looting. If, so we, we were consumed, actually, as Africans, you could argue, we were consumed as raw material, as humans, for colonialists. And even missionaries also consumed us for their own sp as their spiritual food. We were their spiritual food. Um, so the colonizers, let me talk off cuff here. The, the colonizers 
and the missionaries conspired. They used the school, the clinic, and the chapel in their mission of civilizing the African. The school, the clinic or hospital, and the chapel to civilize the, the African. The savage African, actually, we are called. Um, if, if you've been to, most, some of you may have gone to a mission school. Or, yeah. If you were, for instance, at Kanisha Secondary School, at Kanisha Secondary School, you have the secondary school, of course, and, and, and there's also a girl secondary school, and, a, and also there's a, some primary school. Then there is also the parish where the chapel is, where people go to pray on Sunday. Then, of course, there is the, the clinic, the Chikuni Hospital and the small clinic there. So the, these were instruments or tools of converting and civilizing the African. Um, and this, the civilizing mission of the colonial master with the help of the missionary was based on this point. It was based on the ethnocentric belief. It was based on the ethnocentric belief that the morals and values of the colonizer were superior to those of the colonized. Uh, let me repeat that. The, the civilizing mission of the colonizers with the support of missionaries was based on the ethnocentric belief that the morals and values of the colonizer were superior to, their, to those of the colonized. Uh, we can go into details of this going back to the Victorian Britain, uh, Victorian England, when the, when the British kind of felt they were a superior kind of race, um, and that they, they, they conquered the lands overseas. Uh, so the, the, there was this feeling of superiority complex. Anyway, let me go back to the school clinic chapel because these were the, the instruments of civilization. Um, and this, in a way, kind of was the pragmatic way of dealing with this ethnocentric belief that the, the colonizers were superior. So what happened at the school? Let's start with school. One, school. Um, in the school, the curricula was tailored to achieve the goals of the colonizer. The curricula was tailored to achieve the goals of the colonizer, rather than train the African to be an independent human being, independent and prosperous, you can add, human being. And from your EAP lessons, where, when you were in first year or something, you read about the three R's, the three R's. So the, the African was, we were only taught the rudiments of the three R's, to read, to write, and to make some basic calculations. And we, to read was mostly 
the, the idea was mostly that you should read the Bible. And of course, it was missionaries who provided education. Government had very little input into education. And, uh, and the BSA company, the British Protectorate, whatever, gave chunks and chunks of land to missionaries because they wanted help from missionaries. Uh, build a school, build this, uh, and, and help us. Uh, and missionaries colluded, connived, and kind of cooperated. Not all of them, many of them cooperated in collecting poor tax, poor tax from the villagers, and in some cases even dispensing justice, uh, even whipping people. Uh, there are stories in Kazembe, where the London Missionary Society, uh, lay missionaries, uh, used to beat people. Anyway, I'm going off a little bit. What am I talking about? It's the rudiments of the three R's of reading, calculating, or adding additions, and uh, writing that were dispensed. Why? It's just to make you become a teacher after your standard six or after your form two. Or you become a clerk in a in a company or in the mines or you become a driver or an office orderly um, that was all and uh, if you recall your EAP lessons history of education in Zambia at independence there were only hundred graduates in this country and they were not graduates of the University of Zambia because there was no University of Zambia. They were graduates of University of Salisbury or Salisbury University, Makerere, and other universities elsewhere. So much denied to us. And also, the school served another function of civilizing us to westernize us and also to disenchant our mind, disenchant our mind, so that we start thinking in Western epistemological knowledge, or thinking in Western paradigms, so that we forget about our, what they called, superstitious pagan mentality. Number two, the chapel, or let's say the church. You, you, have, a, you have a chapel at, on, the, on the campus uh, built by the Jesuits. Um, you know what happens there. But the intention in those days was to replace the traditional world view or the traditional religious cosmology with a Christian religion. Transplant, it just erase the traditional worldview, the traditional religion, erase it, uh, and inscribe the Christian religion on, on, the, on the African. Uh, some missionaries, however, went to the extent of believing that the African, in fact, was simply a tabula rasa, a blank slate without religion at all. Yeah? The African was like a beast in the wilderness. And, and so religion, the Christian religion, had to be inscribed on this blank slate. Um, so so the, the, the church or the chapel would stop the African from believing in spirits, such as ancestors and other spirits, 
and believing in the African God and take on the African, the, the Christian God. But you and I, I think, will agree that, uh, in fact, these missionaries d had, cannot claim that they introduced, they did introduce the Judeo-Christian God. But it's, the, it's, the, it's our gods or God that they named God in their Western understanding. Yeah? Because they did not find an equivalent of our God to uh, the Western God or Christian God. So, for instance, Chauta in Tumbuka, as you know, is, um, is not the Judeo-Christian God, but he has become the Christian God now. Chauta was a spirit of the hunters. Uta is the, 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 the bow. Uh, the arrow, I don't know what it is. But Chauta was the spirit of the hunters. But in, is that spirit of the hunters is now the Christian God among the Tumbuka. Yeah? Some of you might be shown on the very Mwari. Mwari was a spirit on the Matopos in Zimbabwe. Uh, he, 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 a spirit. He wasn't a god. And now Christians took uh, missionaries took the name of Mari. So, in other words, it, there was a Christian a Christianization of the African god, rather than supplanting or removing our god. Uh, okay, so that's um, what else can I say? Uh, you will agree with me, of course, that uh, traditional names were discouraged. In, uh, by, by Christian missionaries. So we, we were given names like John, James, Thomas, Joseph, Peter, Titus, Amos, Agnes, Josephine, Helen, Simon, and, and all this, Rosemary, Christine, all these names. And it, it, it is only, for instance, when at, in terms, I'm talking, well, let me give the example of the Catholic Church, um, which I'm familiar with. It was, it was only when the notion or concept of incarceration was introduced that you could be baptized uh, with your own indigenous name. Uh, earlier, it wasn't the case. You, you had to be named after a saint or after some biblical name or something, or just some uh, English name. Yeah. So that's, uh, that was the, the, the chapel. Uh, let's go to number three, the clinic. Of course, the clinic was there to dispense medicines, to look after the sick, and sick in many ways, mentally, physically, uh, whatever, because spiritual sickness was dealt with in the chapel or in the church. So... The clinic also had another hidden or subtle agenda. It is at the clinic that uh, belief in what causes illness in African tradition, traditional life was changed. In other words, the aim of the clinic was to change belief in what causes illness and even death or death. So at the clinic, we, we were told that you are suffering from malaria and malaria is not caused by a witch or by spirits. Malaria is caused by 
is it some bacteria or germ or whatever it is that uh, a female Anopheles mosquito will bite you and introduce a virus or whatever it is in your a bacteria in your blood and this is what causes the fever and everything. Whatever sickness you, you, you suffered from, you were told the cause of this sickness is this. But of course, that doesn't mean that the people took, took, they took everything, they took such things with a pinch of salt. If there was no treatment, if I was not cured at the hospital, I went back to, my, to the diviner or to, to the herbalist in the village. Um, so that, that, that was the clinic. So apart from, a, w w apart from converting people to Christianity, the clinic was also trying to convert people to modern medicine, modern Western value, values and most Western epistemology of how to understand how no, uh, uh, things as scientifically understood. Um, the, let, me, yeah, let me give you this example. An interesting study was done by Dr. Walima Kalusa. Some of you, if you did history, you might have known him. Doc, he was in the Department of History, and he his PhD was uh, was in on in um, medical history or something like that. He he went to Johns Hopkins University in the U.S. and his his site his field work was in Ikeleng, in northwestern province. Um. The, 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 this is where Water Fisher and the CMML started this mission. It's a big mission, Tokoloki and, and other missions. So, Walima Kalosa was told by some old missionary that when Fisher came and started giving water painkillers and things like that to people, People found it incomprehensible and actually ludicrous that they were asked to drink the medicine, to drink the painkiller, or to drink whatever. Because they didn't see how you can drink a Panadol to cure pain. You have pain in the head. They didn't see the the point. So most of them would hide, carry the, the painkiller, go home, get a razor blade, somebody makes some cuttings on, on the forehead or in places where the pain is, they crush the painkiller and rub it in. So different way of understanding. Tradition against modernity. Uh, so that's uh, an example I wanted to give you. Anyway, overall, overall, I think you can argue that the combined conspiracy of Christianity and colonialism resulted in the abandoning of African values the combined conspiracy of Christianity and colonialism resulted in the abandoning of, of Christian values. Um, but there's one thing that I should draw your attention to, ladies and gentlemen. Education, especially education, was a, a double-edged sword. Education not was um, a liberator. It helped us, our nationalists, to shake off colonial rule. So, 
while the, the colonial masters thought that the little education they were giving to the people was enough to keep them contented and remain uncivilized, it actually broadened some of our nationalist minds and they began to fight colonial rule. So, for instance, Kenneth Kaunda, Simon Kapwepwe, and others were educated at Luwa Mission of the Free Church of Scotland. And they became radical nationalists. In fact, the founder of the nationalist movement, if you are a historian, uh, Donald Suale from Mwenzo Mission, was also a missionary, ed mission educated person. Harry Kumbula was educated by the primitive Methodists in Namwala, became a teacher, became a nationalist. Mainza Chona was educated by the Jesuits at Chikuni, became a nationalist, though he did not become a teacher, he, he, he took law instead. So education, so, so education, what I'm saying, what I'm saying is that education was ambivalent. Yeah. In the, in the thinking of the colonial masters is that uh, this would at least give them some rudiments to operate in our colonial structures. But at the same time, it simply opened their eyes and they began to question things. But of course, nationalism has, is an interplay of so many factors. There were other issues that opened up the minds of the people. But even mi some missionaries contributed to nationalism, and some of them were nationalists, actually. Yeah. OK. Um, now, today, we. Currently or presently, we are in what the people are calling the globalizing or the global community. Yeah. Global community. Very nasty term, actually. And, and to many Af radicals in, 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 in Africa, people like he, um, I talked about in Mbembe and, and others. Mudimbe and, and the rest. To them, this animal of globalization is just neo-imperialism. It's the new imperialism or new colonialism. Um, so the globalizing world has brought its own issues also. So we are seeing greed we are seeing egoism or egotism. And we are seeing loss of community. The cherished values are really being elbowed to the side, shelved. Yeah? The decline of moral values is actually catastrophic. And you can bear witness to this. What are people doing with their phones and all that? The, the amount of things that kids, young people, uh, have, have had to see. Incredible. So this global thing, this modernity, whatever it is, or post-modernity, is, is a disaster. So let me just take you through some of the issues on which you can be examined just to write a few things. Okay, let's, let's look at some of the values. I don't know if they are values or whatever, Western values, that we are facing, and that we have to live with currently. You can go through them very fast. Homosexuality. Yeah, uh, and don't quote me here, what I'm going to say here 
in Lusaka, for instance, don't cut me, please. And you will have to find out yourself. My feeling and my observation and my intuition tells me that there is a large community of homosexuals, especially among the Chinese. Um, and you can even go to East Park and stand there, observe for some hours, and you can tell who is a homosexual among some of these Chinese as they come in to do some shopping. And it could be among the white community also. So homosexuality is an issue. Um, indecency. Indecency. Just general indecency in the way of dressing. I, I'm not particularly opposed to the way people dress. I mean, if they want to walk naked, they can. Yeah, whatever. But really, do you have to go to that extent when you have a context, a cultural context of your own? You look at yourself, you look at our, let's look at ourselves as Zambians and we look at Indians, for instance. Modern, but, but stuck to their values, their culture, in dress, in, in food, in religion or philosophy and things like that. So lots of indecency, actually, including boys, girls, boys, and everybody. Boys, their trousers hanging in the buttocks, almost falling off and all that, in indecency at its best. But again, I'm saying I'm not opposed to this. Every one of us has their, uh, is, uh, is entitled to their way of thinking. But the common good, the common values, the shared values are important. I think then individualism you can indicate. Individualism. You know what I mean by that. Non-respect for life. Non-respect for life. We have an unrespect for life, human life, I think, and animal life, even plant life, the damage we are doing to our neighbors, the trees, the animals um, that sustain us. Issues of uh, adultery, divorce, incredible. Illicit sex. Incredible. Yeah. Drugs. Alcoholism. Yeah. I I go to Kalundu market, you know Kalundu for my haircut. And you see these boys every day there. Young boys, most of them are not students. But they come from affluent families in the community by nine hours they are 10 hours 11 they are completely wasted and you you wonder what's going on i don't think you can also include street kids unheard of i mean our culture we we took care of our kind we, we never gave our children to the streets we never uh, gave birth to children we were going to surrender to the public. Insincerity, this you have noticed also, insincerity, dishonesty, unfaithfulness, cheating, to the extent that we even cheat in exams, we cheat in our essay writing and everything. And by the way, let me warn you that UNSA has now procured a software that, will, that detects plagiarism. So if you just copy stuff from the internet and whatever, you will be heavily punished. In fact, this reminds me of 
have to go to CICT to have the software installed on my on my on my PC. So as as you start sending in your assignments, it will be easier for me to dismiss them as copied and zero given um, because you have cheated. If you do not, of course, acknowledge your sources. Then there is corruption. I don't have to dwell on this. You know what corruption is. It's a moral evil. A moral evil. Knowingly done. Bribery. You know that. Favoritism. Nepotism. Irresponsibility, irresponsiveness, embezzlement, crime, organized or unorganized crime, deceit, lies exploitation and the list is long it goes on and on and on why am i giving you some of these examples i some you could be asked for instance a question on moral evil explain a moral evil in this country and the device uh, or advance a remedy by going back to the roots or something like that? Or what can we learn from traditional values to, to address this problem? Uh, the most unfortunate thing, I think you'll agree with me as young intellectuals, the most unfortunate thing is that those who govern their own people are the ones involved in systemic corruption, plunder, and dehumanization. The people we vote for to govern us, to save us, become our enemies. They become suddenly thoroughly corrupt. You could even think that maybe they went to a university that they took courses in corruption. How they learn the art of graft, the art of stealing, the art of plunder, and dehumanize, dehumanizing of people. Um, the point I'm making, however, and it should be clear with you, is that the, this problem of corruption and whatever in, in politics is endemic. And to tell you the truth, no one, no one can cheat me that they will deal with this problem. In fact, people are fighting to get into politics for that, for self-aggrandizement and whatever. Um, so in the, what am I saying? In concluding, you, say, you could simply say that we have a kind of, a, what term can I use? How, how should I put it? I want to put it in a very smart way. We have kind of swallowed the hook the sinker and the line of new values, if you get what I'm, what I'm trying to say, by that proverb you're saying. You know the, the line when you go fishing, the line, there is the, the sinker, the kaflot, and then the hook with the bait. That's, the white, that's what the Westerner came with, the whole thing, 
and we have swallowed the whole, all of it um, uh, uncritically. Yeah. So that uh, dishonesty, cheating, fraud become part of us. And we have ki kind of uh, uh, gotten rid of our ancestral moral uprightness and probity. Yeah. What that our ancestors taught us, that we see still alive. Okay. So we, we shall leave it at this for today. And thank you very much, unless there's a question. <laughs>